Hello, welcome back. Guess what this episode is? Who can guess? It's a special it episode. The anniversary episode of our um, podcast. Yep, our first wow. year anniversary podcast year. Yeah, it's crazy. We've been doing this a year. I'm excited. Nice. Yes, it's great. It's a, a fun thing to do. I like it a lot. Yes, I do too. Uh, we have a lot to talk about, but first, um, Bill is going to tell us all about Strategic Con. Yeah, so for Memorial Day weekend, it was uh, another one of the Strategic Cons at the LA International Airport. Uh, this one is their GameX convention. That's, I think that's the name for this one. Um, it's more than just miniature gaming. There's a lot of board gaming and role-playing games, but we're here to talk about miniature games and uh, if you looked at the original list of games, there wasn't a lot of stuff on the plate, but um, there was actually more stuff there in person than I thought there would be. Um, for starters, the San Diego uh, Miniature War Gaming Group came up, and they gave a, a big uh, demonstration of Pikeman's Lament, and that went over pretty well. I know someone who played it and really enjoyed it. Um, there was also... Is that from uh, Warlord Games? Uh, Pike Wins Lament, no, that, that's, I think that's one of the little Osprey blue, blue books. Right um, and I'm told I should look things up now so that we don't give people bad information during our podcast. Oh, we don't do that. Oh. Not, that's yes. not what I've heard. <laughs> that's rumors. That's, yeah, that's yeah. you're talking yeah. to the wrong people. Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So it's, it is one of the little Osprey blue books, the Pike Wins Lament. So, so it's like Patriots, Rebels and Patriots. Like Rebels and Patriots and stuff like that. Yeah. So does it fit in the beer and pretzels uh, kind of uh, miniature gaming? I assume so. I mean, there's not a lot of room in those books for rules, so I assume it's fairly high on rules, and hopefully it plays like the other uh, books books in the series that are like Rebels and Patriots and stuff like that. I think it's in the same kind of series. Mm -hmm. So it was nice to see some people from San Diego up there, and they brought the supplies to run a game, so that was kind of nice. Um, other than that, there was actually a lot of Actung Panzer demos. I, I think... Uh, I saw maybe three or four on the on the uh, schedule over the course of the weekend. And then there were a couple of uh, standards that we see at the con. There's, uh, there was a Wings of War game where anyone could just drop in and, and play the old Wings of War game. And then there was a larger ACW game in the back. And, of course, there was lots of Battletech, which is why I was there all three days. So. And ACW, nice. for those people that don't know, is American Civil War. Yes, it is. So, so now... I have to say, oh, go ahead. You're finished. I was gonna say, yeah, it was it was a great time at the con. Uh, Dior's room was busy. Um, more a lot of miniature games. It was actually a very busy con overall. Though the, a lot of most of the tables were taken. So yeah. How did you end up doing, um, Phil? Uh, let's see. Friday, it was just kind of a BattleTech grinder game where that's the kind of game where you could drop in, play a mech. You get destroyed. You get you advance to the next uh, weight class, and and so on. Um, I did get a little prize for headshotting somebody, uh, so that was nice. nice. Uh, the the second day was a uh, giant alpha strike game. Um, the history in the history of BattleTech at the beginning, they borrowed a lot of their um, robot designs from from Japanese anime. And one of the uh, shows that they borrowed from was something called Fang of the Sun Dugram. And the person ran, ran a big game based on one of the key battles in that anime. And he had a lot of 3D um, STL-based models uh, uh, that were actually more true to the TV show than than the current Battletech minis. And that, that was a lot of fun. I think we we won by like one percentage point. So it was, it was a very wow. close game. So... Yeah. And then the third day, Sunday, was the tournament. And we had people come up from San Diego for that as well. And I did not do well. I brought a new list where I wanted to try a, a new kind of list, and it did not work out at all. <laughs> so, But I still had a lot of fun. So, yeah. so, that, so that was it Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And the next convention will be Labor Day weekend. Excellent. Um, oh, okay. so now, Phil, you brought up this interesting little point here about um, misinformation. So can you elaborate on that? <laughs> I don't remember the specifics, but we might have gotten some rules confused with other rules in the past, I've, I've been told. So 
Oh. There are people watching this podcast or listening to this podcast just screaming into the void when we say something incorrectly and willing to correct us. So that, well, that great interest. We will definitely correct ourselves. But um, that means we have people listening, so that's good. Yes. That's and, right. But we have to listen to the people listening. So we'll try to do that and uh, maybe come up with we have a Facebook group, left uh left coast gamers chat, where you can post your um corrections that we need to broadcast for you because you know we're valuable humans we're not ai um so we'll we'll try to work on that that's that's very cool um excellent yeah so let's see did anyone go to the church on may 25th well we're calling it studio city right yes yes yeah because the person that runs the venue says in his post studio city come to studio Studio. city yeah (laughs) um i did not go okay yeah that was just an open open gaming day i believe just checking the the past set of events so yeah do you like a good amount of people showed up though that's good did you see it on facebook what they posted? i did see i did see it on facebook yeah i'm not exactly sure uh what was played i'm just looking at it down but i didn't bother to look to see if there are any pictures of the event i think but... they tried out test of honor that day because oh, um that's right. We're having a big uh, test of honor event at Odyssey in August. So, okay. So, um, moving on to the anniversary of the attack on Russia, June twenty second, two nice. fat Lardy's games at Studio yes. City. You were there. I saw your picture, Mark. Yes, I was there. I was playing a chain of command, um, doing like a teaching game. I was umpiring it or game mastering it or whatever the official, um, you know, name is for that. Uh, it was really fun. Um, you know, it was two people that I think were just new to it. So like you, Paul, they, I think were frustrated with some of the charts that you have to look at and um, stuff like that. Cause the flow isn't right there right away. You have to, it's not intuitive right away uh, um, sometimes. So I, I think um, that, you know, we'll have to, I'm hoping that people will just give it a second chance and keep working on it. And I like that game a lot. Chain of command. Yeah, chain of command, and then Phil, uh, you did. I did what a cowboy, and I ran. So I ran two games of what a cowboy. Uh, the first one was pretty, went pretty well. It was two on two. It was a, a pretty tight battle. I don't think any of the models actually died on the table, uh, but in the second game, had three people had a three way battle, and basically two of the players were shooting at each other, not doing a lot of damage, and the third player came in and shot up both the other teams. And did a lot of damage, and that's it's a one of the hard parts about some of these two fat lardies games is that it, when you when you start taking damage um, in your models, you basically have less activation dice, and it's hard to come back. Sometimes when you start losing dice permanently, it's hard to come back. And, and one of the players got hit pretty hard in a in a volley and lost a lot of dice, and and it it, it was tough for, for him at that point. But but I think they had a good time. Um, a couple of the players drove from fairly far away. I I don't remember where. I mean, I think did someone uh, here to Hatchapi? Did someone come from the Hatchapi? Uh, yeah, Oceanside. yeah. So there was so yeah. We had I think thirteen people there. Yes, and, and there was also a table set up for what a tanker as well. And so yes. we had basically two games. Uh, there was a morning session and an afternoon session of both games. Yeah. Yeah, so the second game, uh, I stepped in and played a, um, an, another player, and we just went over the rules and played it through, and it was really good. So um, I like the two fat lardies. Again, it's a you know it's an acquired taste. I think you have to try them out and see the mechanics a little bit and see understand what's going on. But uh, we're going to have another one in the next six months, so people come out and try them out. So in, in What a Cowboy, does it have a similar system? I haven't seen it. I just looked at... Um chain of command where they have the uh sort of a pre-game game that you play and then you get involved in the regular game is that the same with there's there's no pre-game but it is similar in a different aspect um in chain of command basically at the start of every turn you roll a set of activation dice depending upon what your force morale is and based on what that role is certain numbers do certain things like in chain of command i forget certain numbers activate Officers, certain active numbers activate small teams and so on. Yeah. In a four, what a, like for example, a four would do a senior officer. And then both what a cowboy and what a tanker, you roll six dice. And the, 
you start with six, and as you take damage, your dice pool shrinks just like in Trade the Command. And if you roll one, you could move. In you could, if you roll a four, you could shoot in both games and stuff like that. And in both those games, a six is a wild card as well. I forget if Chain of Command has that as well. So in, in that way, the three games that we demonstrated had that in, in, in common. So now I've played a lot of Saga, where it sounds like you're explaining a little bit of Saga, where they have, but they have special dice. But again, you have a chart and you can then put those dice after you roll them into slots of activation that do different things for your army. I mean, in, in Saga, though, I mean, it's, it's a lot more tied to the list. The different armies have different have different options available to them. Here, everyone's got the same. A, a one is a move, a two is a, is a spot, a three is an aim, four and five are shoot and reload, and a six is a wild card. And that's okay. almost the same as what a tanker. Yeah, chain of commands is slightly bit different. When like if a four would have a a senior officer be able to activate when they have three orders that they can do, so yeah. it's a, it's a little different. But okay, I'm I'm getting a feel for the game. Having not played either, I yeah looked, looked a lot at what a, a chain of command, but I haven't looked at what a tanker or um, what a cowboy. Yeah, and they did the what a tanker in the fifteen millimeter at this this event. So it's pretty cool. It looked really nice on the table. But that's usually just one player, one tank, right? Um, I, I think they were doing normally. It is. I think they were doing two tanks per person, and in the in what a cowboy, it was two cowboys per person, and you could do the same thing. Well, I mean, you could do one, you could do two, and so and so on. Okay, well that sounds exciting, and then. Um, we had we met on the 18th, right? Yeah, we did. We had a great uh, scenario. We played out of the um, D-Day British Sector campaign book. Uh, scenario five, it was the V-1 raid um, scenario. Um, do you want to go over it, Paul? Um, yeah, I think the thing that we kind of came away with was on scenarios like that where you need to rush out and get something and rush back you really need to rush out. You you really just are doing run orders and it's pretty hairy because you were very good about your assault and never were able to get um, intelligence back. I think you got two of the intelligence. Is that right? I, I did actually. I mean, I was pretty impressed with my ability to get into your lines and get up, up in there and do that. So I was happy with that. Um, I think my major mistake was I, I charged my officer out and gave you free points you know, um, being dumb and assaulting when I shouldn't have, I should have just um, fired from where I was. So that, you know, that gave you that two extra points, which kicked the game into your favor, you know, but overall it was a really fun, fun uh, scenario to play. I highly recommend it. And then I got to get out my little Sarissa V1 rocket launchers model. So that was cool. I think the thing that impressed me most about that scenario is the fluidity of the action. It's, Mm -hmm. The German, I got to set up in fortifications way back in the back of the backfield. You come on, and then I have to wait till turn three to come on, but I come on the same edge. So you yes. literally are sandwiched in between. Yes, um, and that's very stressful because you're like, okay, what do I do? Do I protect my rear end or I just keep going forward and see what happens? Yeah, I almost want to play that again just to see what would happen if you just rushed those positions and then the game flips where where you just assaulted your assaulting back the other way yeah that would probably what what you should be doing truthfully but still that's a lot of losses you're probably going to take yeah you got to jump out of your trucks and stuff at the right time that's the problem if you take your damage when you're in the side of the truck then your men are pinned out or half destroyed so it's when do you jump out and I bought those little, um, I'm not going to get the name right. There's. <laughs> I know it's Stellan, I believe. It's the little turrets that. Yeah. It's like turn, but Sturm, right? And I believe so. Tellung, right? Sturm I, th Tellung. I, think... I think that's how you pronounce it. I'll have to. Agree. Right. So don't, please don't beat us up on the internet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we I haven't speak. had German. I haven't had German in 20 years. Oh, no Sprechen Sie Deutsch here. So, okay. Uh, the cool thing was those little turrets are just little medium machine guns and they have to be inexperienced. 
So I think they were more of a psychological. Um, well, yeah, I mean, because I was stressed on them uh, blowing up my Jeeps and trucks off skin, you know, because the media machine gun is powerful, uh, six shots. So, yeah, but everything's plus one because they're inexperienced. Yes, exactly. So, you, you know, you, it's just something that you're thinking about. Yep. Yeah, it's a really good scenario. I, I recommend it. Do you remember what it was called? <laughs> um, it's I, the I V1 it sites. V1 rocket launch or V1 uh, raid, V1 raid or something. Yeah, V1 raid. Yeah, it was very cool. And then we had some real casualties. Yes. yes. Oh, yes. So, uh, Butterfingers showed up and... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I oh, dropped. Awesome. We were doing our after action report and every turn we film what's going on. And I, my iPad slipped out of my hands. Um, in my defense, the keyboard came off, which is, yeah. you know, and just yeah. smashed an elite unit of SS. <laughs> so we took a picture of that. Maybe I'll post that on the uh, gamer chat. Uh, They've been page. in surgery and repaired now. Oh, they're all back together. Yeah. That's repaired very good. Broke a bunch of guns and everything. It was tragic. Very tragic. Five men out of. A 10 man squad were just hopefully deep. hopefully gave them leave for two weeks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they went to Oktoberfest. No. That's right. Um, <laughs> right. um well, I'll say actually I'll jump in now and say that I was also able to get a D-Day game of Bolt Action in with some friends down awesome. in Huntington Beach. Um this was from the uh Overlord campaign book. It's called uh it was a scenario uh called Operation or Objective XYZ. And it's a very cinematic kind of scenario. It's much different than anything else I had played before. Um, so the, it's an early morning scenario. So the Germans are in a town of basically 15 buildings. They have 10 different units, I think, in 10 different buildings. And they're all they're all green. And they all start with two pins because they're basically asleep, is, is mm. the story. Uh, the allies, basically, the Americans... They start with basically one small command staff next to one of the buildings, and he's basically a special character. He could go into buildings and shoot with extra machine guns, and with extra an extra die on his SMG and stuff like that. And so turn one, he's just supposed to go into the building he's next to and basically mow down all the Germans. And then some more allies start showing up. There's um, across the road, they have a there's a squad, and then there's an LMG team, and then more. Reinforcements start coming on later, and then the Germans, of course, start waking up and stuff like that. Um, it was, I mean, it felt like a movie. The special character was just going into buildings and mowing down Germans. Um, it was a tough scenario for the German player. The Americans could bring um, heavier units like tanks, and the Germans couldn't do anything like that. But it was a lot of fun. I mean, you were very constrained in the kind of list that you have. I mean, the Germans basically just have standard squads. That's it. Uh, the Americans get like four or five units that these are what you get to start. And then you get the, you can make a small reinforcement list that that's from one of their, uh, one of their special lists and stuff like that. But it was different. It was, it was kind of different to play something that wasn't the standard, just line up and shoot each other. So it was a good change. Yeah. I'm finding the book, um, campaign scenarios are pretty fun. Sometimes, you know, um, give it a chance, um, get it something a little different, like you're saying, Phil. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I'd kind of been, been bored with bolt action for a while. And this this really helped to do a different kind of scenario that that you're limited in, your, in what you could take. And but it's a fun historical based scenario. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, yeah, it's from the campaign, the D-Day Overlord book. And it, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, Excellent. I think that's where the strength of bolt action is now in the campaign books and the ability like the Mark and I battle that we had, which was so fluid. Um we have another one. We're moving away from the D-Day and moving into uh, the Russian um, Stalingrad book. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to try to do scenario one, two, three in order and just go until we can't go anymore. You own a bunch of the models, right, Mark? Yeah, I, uh, actually, um, Chris and I were going to try to do the same thing in order, but we fell off. But we have I have the train for one and two. I built all the hills and got the Sarissa boats and stuff for two. And the bridge is obviously easy to do for, for one. And I've been thinking about what I'm going to do. Um, Cause I'm going to be the Soviets, I believe. And I got to uh, get eastbound and down across that bridge. So, so are we going to 
buy a grain elevator? Um, we'll see what happens. I think I can build some of that stuff. Um, you know, when we get to Pavlov's house, I know that they they pre make those buildings. So maybe you know, we'll see what see if Santa can bring Pavlov's house to us or, or something. Well, I would like <laughs> definitely to try to do this and and catalog it, do the mm -hmm. battle reports. I think that'll be really fun and for sure. For and sure. we definitely have the models, so that's not a problem. Yeah, it's not a problem there. And I was thinking of bringing an uh, Black 36 to the next game. Oh, look at those eyebrows go up. I bet you are. <laughs> I just have to duck my head. In. This is another one where I have to get across the bridge and blow it up before you get. I think I have to look at those um, victory points. I think you get points for killing my units and blowing up the bridge. So I got to get people. F so I think I just have to get, keep my head down and just go. No, I think I need to capture the bridge. Is that right? Oh, and I have and I have you to have blow, to it blow it up. Okay, yeah, that's yeah, you, I think that's. But I also have to get my men across before I blow up the bridge. That's, Wait, no, that's... no, you don't have to do that, Mark. Yeah. I was wondering, you know, it is the Soviet Union. We don't need those guys. <laughs> you have so many guys. Why are you worried? Right. Uh, so that's exciting. We'll have that to report on next podcast. Yes. Um, well, the big news for me, because um, I had heard about it kind of brewing, was War Machine. So I know, Phil, you said you played Mark II for a while? Yeah, I, I played uh, Mark II, the local store in Santa Monica. Aero Hobbies had a really good War Machine scene for a while. Um, uh, a lot of people were playing it. Uh, I had a good-sized Kador army. Um, I don't have much of it anymore, but it, it was... Uh, I, I thought the rule book was particularly well written, and it was one of the first games I got into because I didn't want to get into a giant GW game. It was a much smaller scale and stuff like that. Um, it was a game that was, though, very designed, it seemed like, for tournaments and competitive play. Yeah, I would support that. I really like the models, so I built a Signar um, army, and then um, I built a pirate army which I still have both of those. And then I got into hordes and um, built a, uh, forgetting the name right now, but the one with the werewolf and all that um, army. Because I loved cavalry, so I bought all the Signar cavalry and I wanted to play that. And people are like, that's not competitive. And I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> it's just really cool. Um, yeah, exactly. the, the models are really cool. They had a, a warcaster on a, a cavalry warcaster. Um, mm. So, and the models are really fun to paint, but it, the scene died away, I think to almost, what was it at LVO this year? I think it was, I didn't check to see how big it was. Um, I'm pretty sure it was there. Um, so the big news is that um, uh, the company that did own uh, the game um, has been has sold the uh, IP, I guess is what you would say, to uh, Steamforge Games, which is kind of interesting because Steamforge Games Games has only been around about ten years, from my understanding. Um, and their philosophy is to really have fun with miniature gaming and do things that are really exciting and fun. So. Um, if you go to the old, um, just forgetting the name of the site um, that War Machine used to sell, it's P3, right? Yeah, P3 Privateer Press. P3 Privateer was their paints. P3 it. was their paints. P3 was their paints. Privateer Press was the site. So if you go to that, it just says, nope, we're just building models. That's it. If you go to Steamforge Games, you'll see... Um, that they have Iron Kingdoms, which was the role-playing game, right? Right. And then they have um, War Machine, but there's no mention of Hordes. And then I read deeply into the interwebs, and I guess they're just combining both of those now and not calling them Warm Hordes, just saying it's War Machine. It, it's, it's one game. They should have one name. It was kind of confusing to some people to have two different names for you. Well, they had two different rule sets too. Well, yeah, but you could play them together. I mean, people would, they'd play against each other all the time. So, yeah, it was very odd. Well, if you bring the rules in the game, I mean, they have open tables at the Studio City a lot, so you can come down and 
show everybody uh, how to. But, but we're not sure what the new rules are going to be because, from what I've heard, it sounds like they're going to. It almost sounds like they want to do a quick turnaround of a new version of, of War Machine, and 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 to me that would be a mistake. I think they need a to start from the ground up and figure out why the game failed. They haven't even addressed that. So mm -hmm. they need to figure it out and then maybe do something different. I, I'm almost afraid to go on the interwebs and just ask those questions because I'm just going to be pounced by uh, gamers that go, oh, no, it's not that. It's this. No, you're wrong. It's, and the flamethrowers are going to be going, you know. Sure. I, uh, I'm looking at the website. They have Signar. Uh, they have Dusk. I don't remember Dusk. Maybe that's... Uh, I, it's been a while since I played. I mean, I think they did announce that they're going to come out with a new two-player starter set. I think it was Signar versus Kador because uh, the, the blue versus the red was their standard. I think they were their two biggest armies. Yeah, and they have Mercenary, which is the pirates, which yeah. is what I built. So I, but I don't see um, much of the Hordes version. Yeah as far as um, find your faction. So there were a lot more factions than just the uh, eight that are here on the yeah. website, right? Yes. But what I also remember, at least from the end of second edition, and was that most of the models were metal. They had started coming out with some plastic slash resin starter sets, and, and those weren't any good. I mean, hopefully they could move to plastic like everyone else is going to. That would be nice. That's what I heard. That is what I read that they are supposed to go to a plastic. Because a lot of those old metal models were big and had lots of parts, and they broke all the time, is what I remember. And I, I had, I mean, I didn't pin anything back then, but there was you had regular twenty millimeter infantry, and then you had either war jacks or beasts, and those were a good four or five inches tall at least, and lots of heavy pieces of metal being glued together on those things. <laughs> Yeah, I had the storm cast uh, lightning mega one that was like this big and weighed a ton, and I it broke several times. But by break, I mean just came apart. You just super glue it back together, which was a pain, um, which you don't see, which you, you would think would be an easy fix just mechanically. If they went to plastic, it would be much easier to... To solve, maybe solve the problem because it wouldn't be so heavy. Yeah, the weight. Yeah, the weight of those arms and stuff, for example, was, was a lot. Yeah. Um, on the website, it actually has our um, crowdfunding campaigns. And so they list several games that they have on their site where there's, you know, uh, crowdfunding, which to me is sort of interesting because that at one point um war machine was hugely popular is that right do you guys remember that i don't it, remember this game at all i don't know what you guys are yeah you're speaking greek to it, me it was i mean it was almost as popular as the gw games in the store mm -hmm. i mean the wall space that it had narrow hobbies was just about the same as uh the wall space at, uh, for gw games i mean they, they had so many products. That was another thing. They had so many different blisters and so many different boxes. Uh, and these days, I think a lot of people are trying to compress it down to like starter sets and boxes type of stuff. And, and they would certainly hopefully go that route. And I think they are going to have at least one starter set. They, they right. can't have as many. They had too many factions and too many models. I know I know that's good, but but I think that's too much for retailers to deal with these days. Yeah, and yeah. I don't see the rules <laughs> when I'm looking on the website, so I'm not sure where that lives. Um, I guess we can look up the the rules where <laughs> machine rules. And so, just... so I mean, right now I'm probably not super interested in getting back into the game, although I liked it back in the day, I would want to have them... I'd want to see new rules for sure. Um, I so really you just didn't, didn't like the rules? I, I Actually, I thought the rules were okay. Um, it was more of a problem. I didn't, after a while, I didn't actually like the models as much. I thought the rules were fairly good, even though it was mere, more geared for tournament players. The models were a pain to build and have them stay together for me. And some of the early models I just thought did not look good either. 
Is this a game where you can use different models from a different no it's like gw you have to have the because the models come with cards and you ha and everything's a special kind of character and stuff like that and it's their own fantasy setting so it's, there's nothing generic about it and the mm -hmm. cards are a little difficult to manage uh because they're just small cards like you would buy a bicycle pack yeah. and then you have to mark out little boxes and like warjacks um. have all kinds of boxes and it would say you know, you'd have to mark them out in a certain sequence. and Yeah, that's going to, yeah. And, you know, we played Octoon Panzer, and we loved right. the game, but the just the mechanics of it can right. quickly bog it down. Um, right. Do you For feel sure. the same way, Phil, with Octoon yeah. Panzer? Yeah, I'm still on the fence of that. I have to, th I'll, I have to think about it. I'm going to have to play it some more. So, so, Paul, what are your thoughts on, on new War Machine? Would you be interested in getting back into it, or have you had enough War Machine for a lifetime? Well, I really liked War Machine. I just felt like the game was so competitive that there wasn't a lot of uh, players out there that were willing to play just uh, for fun. So I And there was a lot of GW players that wanted to just have fun, and of course the, I played ASL. So I had lots of opportunities to play. So if that game were to spin back to a more uh, fun, like thematic steampunk kind of thing, yeah, I would love to go back because my models are all painted. Um, okay. Yeah. The, the problem is we don't know what the rules are going to be because I right. think they ended on Mark four. I kind of bowed out at Mark two. Um, yeah. Something else I remember about the community that kind of turned me off is that a lot of people were playing the game with unpainted models, and I had never seen that before in any any other game. And Paul, you're shaking your head. You remember that as well? Yeah, and I come always painted. Uh, yeah. So I would come with these armies, and people would be like, "Wow, that's really cool. I'm gonna kick your butt." <laughs> and I'm like, "What? Okay, but wait a second. We're missing the point here, aren't we? No, I'm just gonna kick your butt." <laughs> uh, so yeah. yeah. And then a lot of people came, uh, and that happens to a lot of miniatures games, which is very sad. Um, especially yeah, they take it like it's risk, where you don't have to, it's like a board game in a way, I guess. Yeah, and GW actually said in their tournaments that if you don't have a painted army, you lose 10 points out of your possible 100 points that you can get. That's good. Uh, uh, yeah, but there's been a lot of hate on that. <laughs> so Hate is uh, going to hate. I know, and I would support that rule, and I've tried to support it, but the wall of people saying, no, yeah. that's not fair. Yeah. Uh, they're just trying to promote the hobby. Yeah. Reward the people that put the time and effort into making their models better. You know. Yeah, but part of me says we just need people to play, too, so uh, we 100%. don't want to kill a hobby just because... Yeah, you know, yeah no, I get it. Maybe they should make a tournament of painted and then unpainted or you know whatever well oh, they well. have you know like at lvo they have the narrative campaign or the narrative games and they have right. games and stuff like that so yeah there's still quite a bit of um opportunities to play speaking mm -hmm. of lvo who bought their tickets i have not i i did not i did not there's there's no reason to buy these regular tickets ahead of time um, because they will not sell out of those. What they did sell out of are is the VIP package. That sold out within four minutes is what I saw online. <laughs> of tickets going on sale. Uh, I know the Battletech tickets are not on sale yet, so I will buy those though when they do and then pick up the general day tickets as well. Are you going, Paul? Uh, not this year. Uh, unfortunately, mm -hmm. I do the robotics you know, with my job, and it lands mm -hmm. smack in the middle of that. And until I can kind of get that program up and running and really uh, healthy. I just feel like that's not a good, you know, use of Understand. resources. I'd like to go, um, mm. but it's a big commitment as well to get out For there. Sure. Yeah. And um, I don't know how much bolt action is going to be there. Bolt action has been there, right? There, there, It's been there both years. And actually, usually John Russell from Warlord is there. He's been there both years. I've seen him there. Um, I think there was also a little Blood Red Skies last year as well. So, so there is a good amount of Warlord stuff there, for sure. Phil will be our field correspondent. I'll report on it when I get back. Is uh, Wi-Fi yeah. is horrible at the yeah. location. <laughs> for sure.
Um, so what about um, some of the local uh, haunts that you guys go to? How is um, Lost Planet? Is that your local haunt or um, Phil? Um, I have played there. Um, actually, I've been trying to set up Battletech groups at, at local places like Paper Hero and Next Gen. I actually was playing Battletech at Next Gen today. Um, four player game. Uh, one guy who was first time playing, one guy who hadn't played much recently. So uh, trying to grow the community there. And I was there a couple of weeks ago as well. So um, been been doing well. Um, they ha uh, Next Gen has decent air conditioning too for the amount of people that are in there, which is a big thing this time of the year because it's now summer. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's a big thing. Um, is Odyssey Games, how's their conditioning going there? Has anyone been lately? I haven't been there since winter. Okay. Yeah, I, it's hard going there sometimes in the summertime. Yeah, because they have all those windows that yeah. are um, eastern facing and it can be really difficult to cool that big Xander's of a... Is the, Xander's still going strong in Camarillo? Well, Xander's of... is awesome. I'm Yeah. I can never say enough about Xander's. Uh, they've redecorated now. They have the little private area. Mm -hmm, little uh, Dungeons and Dragons kind of themed area. Yeah. Um, we just played Hail Caesar there, a bunch of us, five of us. So it was fun. Good place to play. Excellent. Um, yeah, so Xander's and Camarillo. Uh, Geeky Tees. Who's been to Geeky Tees besides me? Just when we, you and I went at the original place, I need to get down to the new place. So, Paul, why don't you tell us about the new place? Okay. So, um, 